Viruses make us sick. They're the bad guys. They make us cough and leak and even die. But have you ever wanted to know how to make one for yourself? Okay, I don't mean like some kind of creepy killer pet. I mean, have you ever wondered if we could make a virus and use it for good? Well, we can. Let's start simple. Viruses are essentially tiny packets of DNA wrapped up in a protein shell. Crack one open and you'll find all the instructions necessary to make as many more as you like from scratch. What's missing, however, are the right building blocks and the right tools. Luckily, our cells are both. With enough persuasion and trickery from the incoming viral invaders, our cells can be convinced to switch out their normal business for a non-stop virus production line. Viruses only care about making as many copies of themselves as they can, so they can continue their quest to spread. Because of this, cells are stripped of resources and forced to work until they die. So why would we want to make one of these little monsters? Whilst holding the world hostage with an army of superbugs is certainly one option, there are in fact some more altruistic uses for these little guys. Harnessing the power of viruses to kill cells can be incredibly useful if the cells themselves are up to no good, such as the case in cancer. The ability of viruses to sneak inside of cells can also make them brilliant tools for gene therapy, providing genes that may be defective in certain genetic diseases. And they can even be used to create vaccines by acting as practice rounds for our immune systems. But what I want to focus on is exactly how can we reprogram viruses to do our bidding. Well, if we want to change the way a virus behaves, then we have to find a way to change the sequence of their DNA. But we can't just open viruses up and stop poking around. We need to use the tools that biology has given us. In the early days, all we knew for certain were that viruses were things that made you sick. And if you coughed or sneezed or bled on someone, then they could get sick too. They're transmissible. This was confirmed when we finally figured out how to use some dishes. We could take some infectious fluid from the patient and stick this on some cells, and after a while the cells would die. Take fluid from these cells and stick this on new cells, and after a while they'd die too. Eventually scientists realised that if you did this enough times, the virus you get out at the end starts to look a bit different to the one that went in. This is because viruses evolve. Like all self-replicating creatures, the more copies of yourself you make, the more likely you are to make errors. These mutations, over time, change the way the viruses behave. A great example of this comes from the work of Albert Sabin and others in the early 20th century. To try and create an effective vaccine for polio, researchers isolated the virus from human feces and forced it to copy itself through a bunch of non-human cell types, including live mice, kidney cells, monkey skin, monkey brains, and even monkey testicles. After all this, Sabin had himself a strain of polio that had lost its edge. All this selective pressure had caused the virus to adapt to life outside the human body. Thus, the strain could still replicate in the gut, but could no longer enter the nervous system and cause paralysis or encephalitis. By infecting people with this attenuated virus, we can allow the immune system to learn how to fight the virus in case it ever comes into contact with the real deal. So then we have method one, evolve your own. Unfortunately, this can take a while and there's no guarantee that the virus you get out of the end will do exactly what you want it to do. Luckily, for those of us lacking in the necessary patience and monkey testicles, our ability to manipulate DNA has been steadily improving over the past few decades. There are now a vast array of molecular tools plucked straight out of biology for chopping, changing and inserting pieces of DNA. One of the latest gene editing kids on the block is known as CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is an incredibly simple method for causing cuts in very precise places in DNA. All you need is the scissor, the Cas9 part and the label that sends it to the right place. This is known as the guide RNA. The individual bases that make up our DNA form the unique sequences that store all of the information to produce proteins. Each base has its own partner base that it likes to stick to. So to target any particular gene that you want to mess with, all you need to do is design a guide RNA with a sequence that matches. This guides the Cas9 scissor to the right place where it cuts. If you simply want to destroy a gene and see what happens, we can leave things there. Cells are incredibly bad at dealing with double strand cuts in DNA. In order to put it back together, it needs a template to go on. If the cell can't find a suitable one, then it just has to make it up. Bits of sequence might be thrown in or taken out, then the gene becomes meaningless. If we're feeling sneaky, however, we can throw in some DNA of our own. DNA that contains a sequence we want to put in. This could be a slight change to a gene or a new gene entirely. The cell recognises portions of this DNA that are the same, and assumes whatever you put in the middle fits too. Getting back to our virus pals, we can use this method to change the genes inside them using cells as our partners in crime. All we need to do is add in our tools, add the virus, and catch the beautiful monsters that are released. This technique is still super new, but it's already been recognised as a potential way to make all manner of weird and wonderful virus-based treatments. So, to sum up, if you want to make your own virus, you can A, evolve one, or B, use CRISPR to change your genes yourself. In either case, you'll need a starter virus, some cells, and a fully functional lab, so if you're looking for the next cure for cancer, viruses could be for you. If you're looking for a new pet, maybe just get a cat or something, 